What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and today we're going to talk about my top 12 dynasty running back rankings. We're going to do a nice tier list as well because I do feel more strongly about the individual tier breaks themselves than, you know, player A versus player B. I figured it's the end of May. Dynasty season is kind of wrapping up here. We're transitioning into redraft season here. So I kind of want to put a bow on everything and kind of give you guys my final dynasty running back rankings heading into the season. I don't think there's going to be a ton of change outside of, you know, of course, you hate to say it, but any injuries that are going to happen in August, whether that's preseason, camp, all of that stuff, that's when changes will happen. We'll address that when we get there. But for now, these are pretty final. I don't think I'm going to be moving these around a ton from now until then. So if you want access to, we're going to do the top 12 today. If you want access to the entire, like, top, like, I have, like, top 80 running back rankings, top 250 overall rankings by cell designations, uh, prospect model stuff, going to be doing redraft rankings soon. There's a ton of stuff. If you want access to anything that I do behind the scenes and all that other cool stuff, that will be on Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. It'll be in the comments. It'll be down below in the description. And as always, if you enjoy this video, make sure you go down below, subscribe, leave a like. We're going to be doing this one take trick today. Let's go. Thirsty, thirsty, trying to choose. I mean, I know I'm pretty cool. My Now, first up, we're going to talk about RB1. Surprise to nobody. Jonathan Taylor, Colts running back. And Jonathan Taylor is pretty much the gold standard at this point for running backs in Dynasty. He is the most resilient asset, which is he's the most insulated asset at running back where everything is fragile. All the running backs suck. The running back landscape is bad right now. Like we need this 2023 class really, really bad right now. Now, Jonathan Taylor, I think, is the only person or the only player on this list where if he has a poor season, he has an injury. I don't think that he would even fall outside of like the top three dynasty running backs, just given where he's at, his age, what he did last year, coming off the RB1 overall season, 1,800 plus rushing yards, 20 touchdowns. He's only 23 going into the season as the RB1 in redraft, which means you know he is the RB1 in dynasty and the RB1 in redraft. So he's going to give you points. He's going to have insulated value. I will say, I think he's probably too expensive to buy at this point, unless if you can get a good price. I think he's probably a hold on contenders because I think you just want him to score points. At this point, his biggest asset is just scoring points for your team while having value insulation. If you're a rebuilder, I'd be selling Jonathan Taylor. You need to get him off of your team. If you're if you're not looking to win, you get him off of your team for like Jonathan Taylor for two or three different assets, gives you a couple of outs to match his roster value and then even profit off of that. I'll also say that even if you think that Jonathan Taylor is overvalued, I think it makes sense if you're in like five or more leagues on one of those contenders that you have, you should have Jonathan Taylor, even though you don't like him or if you think that he's overvalued. I know a lot of people in this space do believe he's overvalued. I have him le- I have him further back than consensus, but I do have him on one team. If you plan to win leagues in 2022, you should have exposure to the 101 in redraft. I think that that just kind of goes without saying. Moving on to A tier, let's talk about my RB2, which I think is going to be a little bit uh, controversial, but this this the running back landscape is just really tough right now. This this A tier, you can have it any which way you want. Again, these tiers are much more, uh, the tier breaks are much more firm than within each one of these. If you want to have Najee ahead of McCaffrey, you can do that. Personally, not me. And when it comes to McCaffrey, I just think at this point, nothing else on the board really looks great. And with McCaffrey, he gives you access to a ceiling that just no other running back has. We had Jonathan Taylor last year, who was great, but he had one of the lower RB1 seasons we've seen. He had only 21 points per game. I think that he didn't even he didn't even hit a legendary win rate. He had like a 16% win rate. McCaffrey just has an access he just has access to a ceiling that completely blows it out of the water. The last time that he played, he had a 30 points per game in 2020. He had 29.3 points per game in 2019. I believe in 2018 he was hovering around like 25 points per game. Just wild. Now, this even puts it more into perspective. It's a tweet from Jacob Sanderson who is one of the guys on Twitter that I think is one of the sharpest minds out there. He is also very firmly on the team. You should be taking swing, swings on McCaffrey because he has a ceiling that nobody else has. He tweeted the stat out. In 13 of Christian McCaffrey's last 26 starts, so half of them, he has compiled 20 or more PPR points, not including touchdowns. So 20 plus points on just yards, just receptions. Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry have 12 of those games in their combined careers over 117 games. McCaffrey has more 20 plus point games, not including touchdowns in those guys in 26 starts versus 117 games. Again, Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry were like the clear one and two guy last year before Derrick Henry went down. McCaffrey blows both of those guys out of the water in terms of like non-TD dependent production, which 
is probably one of the more sticky ways to measure production. He has a crazy floor. He'll give you 20 points in a week without even scoring a touchdown. He is just something that we don't have in dyna- or in fantasy in general right now. Now, the biggest question mark with McCaffrey is I'm sure a lot of you guys are saying, you know, yeah, but uh, he's injury prone. And I get that a lot of people are scared by that. But the issue that I have with these injuries is that a lot of them are are kind of just like bruises and bumps. Not not, And I'm kind of being an idiot by saying bruises and bumps. But we're talking about a ankle sprain. Like since 2020, we're talking about an ankle sprain, a shoulder sprain, a thigh sprain, a hamstring sprain, another ankle sprain. These aren't ACL tears. These aren't Achilles tears. These aren't career enders. I'm much more open to the idea of calling a player injury prone or, or fading a player because of injury coming off of one of those major injuries. But he's literally coming off of a ankle strain. And I know that he's had a couple of them now, but I just don't believe in running backs being injury prone, especially a guy in McCaffrey, who even though he's undersized, he play, he only missed one game in his entire career at Stanford. He has been nothing but like an Iron Man up until like the last like two or three years. Now, it's hard for me to fade a guy like McCaffrey because of him being like injury prone is because all running backs are injury prone. We saw this last year. We saw McCaffrey, Saquon, Derrick Henry, Nick Chubb, Cam Akers, DeAndre Swift, uh, Dobbins, ETN, all miss meaningful James Robinson. We also we saw them miss meaningful playing time despite most of those guys not being, you know, injury prone labeled their entire career. So again, running backs just get hurt at a very high rate. And it's hard for me. It's hard for me to say, you know, this running back has a higher floor than the other. Last year, Derrick Henry was drafted for his floor. He didn't give you a floor because he got hurt. None of these running backs, like they literally voluntarily take part in car crashes every Sunday and break their bodies between the tackles. None of these guys are safe. Like there is no such thing as a high floor running back, like Iron Man type guy at this point in time. I mean, maybe there's a couple, but it, you just don't see it a ton. And I think that Jacob Sanderson this is another tweet again. More Christian McCaffrey. Uh, propaganda pretty much but he makes really good points here in in terms of kind of how probability works in terms of and how that sort of affects injury proneness in the NFL he says if you flip 100 coins 100 times you wouldn't expect all 100 to be 50 and 50 so if injuries were truly 100% random and I don't necessarily think that that's the case you'd still expect some players to rarely be injured and others to constantly be injured so in this case let's say heads means that you get injured tails means you don't get injured there's going to be some players who Let's, so if, if tails means you get injured, head, heads means you're healthy. There's going to be some players who flip the coin four times in a row and they're going to hit tails and they're not going to be healthy. And then all of a sudden they sort of get out of that funk. We've seen that now with Fournette, who was who had injury concerns at LSU, who came to the NFL and had injury concerns with the Jaguars, has now put together a couple of healthy seasons. Same thing with Mixon. Early on in his career with the Bengals, he had a ton of injuries. Now he's fine. These running backs, you know, you kind of just, you land on you land on tails a couple times in a row and you get out of that funk. Like there aren't many running backs you can say are inherently injury prone. So I think it's really tough to say that when we're talking about sprains, we're not talking about ACL, we're not talking about Achilles, that McCaffrey is like doomed to injury. I, I truly do think that McCaffrey has pretty much flipped tails three times in a row, but that doesn't mean for 2022 and moving forward, he doesn't still have a 50% chance to be fine, right? If he, if theoretically that, I'm not saying he has 50% chance to not be injured, because that's just a, a random number, but I'm just simply saying that if, if you equate injuries down to flipping a coin, that he has just a good of chance to be healthy as most other running backs. Going into the season, he still has a 50-50 chance of hitting t- heads or tails. So again, if we zoom out, I think we understand, you know, the inherent risk of running back as a whole, that if all running backs are injury prone, if all running backs get hurt, then why not swing for the guy that has an up, has an upside case that nobody else can replicate? If, if McCaffrey hits his ceiling and you have him on your team, he's going to be a 30% win rate plus type player. He's going to give you an impact on your lineup week to week, the same way that Co- Cooper Cup did last year he will be a league winner type guy a running back that no one else can even touch in terms of point scoring so that's why he's my rb2 i want access to that difference making production because that is how you win championships now moving on to rb3 we're going to talk about deandre swift and i will say that this is where it gets really hairy man the rb3 for me i'm very firm on mccaffrey being there rb2 just because of the ceiling but it's tough. I diverted Swift here just because he has that like Kamara esque type skill set where he can really catch passes. He's 23 years old. He has the skill set we want. He was the RB8 in points per game last year. He's second among all running backs last year in target share with 18.4%, which is like a wide receiver target share. That's really impressive. The main issue with, with Swift yet 
is we haven't seen a crazy season, right? RBA in points per game, he had like 16 points per game last year. That's nothing to be super, super excited about. We want to start to see him, you know, compete as like a top five running back. And the biggest concern for Swift at this point is his rushing production. His career high in rushing yards is 617 rushing yards. He hasn't shown like a Kamara Eckler level of efficiency slash like sort of like touchdown luck where he can, or Aaron Jones even, where he's super efficient and he's getting like a, he's getting almost like 20 points per game off of just like explosive plays, efficiency, efficient running between the tackles. He is a guy right now that, you know, he plays the running back position. He's going to need to show that he can actually run between the tackles at some point in time to be a top five running back in fantasy, like we have him right now in Dynasty. Last year, among running backs of 50 or more carries, he was 49th in rushing grade, 47th in yards after contact per attempt on PFF. Now, again, it's not a massive concern because efficiency isn't necessarily sticky year to year. I believe that he was much better in his rushing metrics in year one, but it's worth noting. I just kind of wanted to highlight the good and the bad with DeAndre Swift. He is a very good receiver. He has a skill set we want, but between the tackles, there is more to be desired. Now, he could take a step forward. That Lions offensive line is pretty good. They're going to have, you know, Jamison Williams now and Chark and uh, Amon Ross St. Brown and TJ Hawkinson. I think that that will probably open the box up a little bit. Again, we just need to see him take a step forward as a rusher and sort of, you know, start to sort of see that 20 point per game ceiling manifest itself because if it doesn't he's going to get moved back to like a back-end rb1 type range then at rb4 we have javante williams who was a great prospect he's only 22 years old which youth at this point in time in the running back landscape is really huge that's really the biggest thing that we can cling on to at this point is just age because nobody is really that good he showed an all-purpose skill set last year he can catch the ball he had 50 plus targets he had 200 plus carries we know he's good he was second in missed tackles forced on pff seventh in yard after contact per attempt fifth in elusive rating he now gets russell wilson who's going to absolutely spike the efficiency of this entire offense for years to come the only major uh, drawback with him we haven't seen him explode for like an rb1 season and they're bringing back melvin gordon so with them re-signing melvin gordon i still think that there's a chance that melvin gordon could just end up being dust i think that there's a chance that they start to give more carries to javante williams but the unleashed javante williams idea that we had pre melvin gordon siding it puts a little bit of a damper on that. We don't want our RB4 and overall in Dynasty to be in some kind of a timeshare where he's not like a Kamara with a Latavius Murray. Then at RB5, I have Brees Hall, Jets running back. And we talked all offseason about Brees Hall, so I don't really want to get super into the weeds on him, but he has an all-purpose skill set. He caught balls in college. He started off four years, super athletic, ran like a 4-4, elite prospect. And at this point, if you are an elite running back prospect, you're 21 years old, you have a case to be as high as RB2 in all of Dynasty off of that alone. I think he's going to be a top 12 running back for years to come in New York. Just needs to perform. The issue with him is I'm just not sure he'll ever have like an RB1 type season. Like we just, ha we just haven't seen him on the field to really know what his upside looks like. He could just be sort of a uh, a Nick Chubb type of guy, which isn't, which isn't bad. But I'm going to be interested to see kind of what he looks like in year one. Now, again, he's insulated. He's young. He's an elite prospect. So... He belongs in that conversation. Then at RB6, who I've been moving up recently, is Najee Harris. And I have such a hard time with Najee Harris because on one side, the running back landscape absolutely sucks. But he's going into a his second year, and he's pretty much a lock to be a top 12 running back this season. Now, the issue for me is two things. is that he's old, and then I'm just not sure he's very good. And I know that you guys are going to come crazy at me, like he commanded all this volume, good players demand volume, and that is somewhat true, though when we look at the Steelers, they had, what, Anthony McFarlane behind him, Benny Snell, just a bunch of bad running backs. You look at the advanced metrics, and you look at expected points, he wasn't good. We look at the top five running backs in total points last year, so you have Jonathan Taylor at 377, Eckler at 345, you have Najee Harris at 300, Mixon at 289. He was the only player in this entire list. So you can see points, you can see expected points, and then the plus minus. So the difference between the two. He was the only running back in this screenshot in the top five to not only underperform his expectation, but he underperformed it by minus 42.2. As good as Jonathan Taylor was, he only outperformed his expectation by 68.4. Like, John Najee Harris was almost a negative, was almost as much of a negative as Jonathan Taylor was a positive. He's also not explosive. His longest rush last year was 37 yards. He never ripped off long runs in, in college either. He's not explosive. He's slow. He kind of just compiles. 
He's now 24. I think the the, big, the craziest thing is, I guess he's going into year two, but people don't understand how old Najee Harris is. He is 24. He is just one month younger than Josh Jacobs. If Najee Harris puts up a back-end RB1 season and his, his owners catch wind that he is going to be 25 next offseason, this time next year, if Najee Harris puts up a like RB10 finish with like 18 points per game again, or like an RB7, RB8 type finish with 18 points per game again, and he's 25... I don't see how he maintains top three, top four running back value like he does in the market. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me. He seems like a guy to me where he's much less in the conversation with these guys in the A tier. He really does feel like early career Leonard Fournette and Josh Jacobs, where he's not going to be super efficient. He's going to kind of, kind of compile his yards. And I think it's actually pretty funny because I think that I'm going to fade Najee Harris for now, but I think it's going to be funny. I think in probably like two years, when he becomes an undervalued, like probably valued around like RB2, but still producing like RB1 numbers, kind of like a Leonard Fournette right now, I'll be into Najee Harris at that point in time. I think that just where he's at in his career arc, he does not fit the archetype that I go for. But again, I have him in A tier. I have him in the same tier as these guys. If you want to have him at RB2, I can't refute it because he did he did look good his, his rookie year. He didn't look good, but he scored a bunch of points his rookie year. He's going into year two. Could be better. Could bounce back in efficiency. I could see the bull case for Najee Harris. I'm just not willing to bet on it. Now, moving on to B tier, we have Saquon Barkley, who is pretty much in this tier and B tier of like these firm win now type running backs that I trust to perform or that I think have league winning type upside. Now with Saquon, we have a similar argument as CMC where, you know, he's had injuries. Saquon Barkley had an ACL tear, so it's a little bit more of a major injury concern there, but he is now two years removed from ACL tear which, you know, we'll take injury discounts all day at running back. Running backs are fragile. Again, all running backs are fragile. He's two years removed from the ACL injury. And again, he has access to a ceiling that I'm not sure many other running backs have access to. I think it's literally McCaffrey. After that, it's Saquon. And then it's everybody else in terms of what their ceiling output looks like in points per game. As a rookie, as a true rookie, Saquon Barkley had a 24 point per game season, which was three point per game better than what Jonathan Taylor did last year in a second season and was the RB1 in all of fantasy. Saquon Barkley was better than that as a rookie. Then he followed that up with an RB7 points per game season. He is one of the highest ceiling running backs, not named McCaffrey. He's also not super old. He's 25. He's only one year older than Najee Harris. Giants upgraded their offensive line with Evan Neal in the draft. They have Andrew Thomas, who's coming along on the other side. They're looking better. They bring in Brian Dable. They they rip out, uh, I can't remember, Joe. they rip out Joe Judge and Jason Garrett, which was just an awful offensive environment. Mike Glennon was starting games last year. Jake Fromm was starting games last year. You now bring in Brian Dable. You bring in a competent offensive play caller in Brian Dable. I'm excited. He has a better offensive line. They have more weapons. They have Kadarius Toney, Wandale Robinson. They now have, um, or not now have, but they have Kenny Galladay. They look the part of a team that is going to take somewhat of a step forward. It's going to be a fun offensive environment. I just don't believe that Brian Dable, a guy who has used his assets creatively and knows how to kind of get the best out of his offensive weapons, I don't think that he sees Saquon Barkley, the talent that is Saquon Barkley, the way they used him early on in his career. And they don't think, you know, in a weak wide receiver room where a wide receiver wants kind of Kadarius Tony or Kenny Galladay, that they don't want to get Saquon involved a ton. I think it just doesn't make sense for them not to use Saquon Barkley in a really big way and he's also at a point now where he's like in the last year of his deal they don't have an extension the Giants could run Saquon Barkley into the ground pretty easily they could literally run him into the ground he doesn't have a market really too much they could run him into the ground and just keep franchise tagging him I think it makes a ton of sense to do something among those lines but we'll see now the other running back I'll put in this tier and I'm a little bit apprehensive too I think that the more I look at it the more I want to put him in D tier but we'll put Eckler here for now at RB8 and He's the only running back outside of Jonathan Taylor and Christian McCaffrey that I'm comfortable with locking and loading as like a top three redraft running back. I think he is one of the more sure things in fantasy where he had 21.5 points per game last year. We want that 20 point per game upside. He is going to be in that range. He'll never be like RB1 and all of fantasy type good, but he's still a very solid like top five type running back. He's only, or I was going to say only 27, but his, his only real concern is that he is 27 He's old, could start declining, but he does have like a very efficient skill set. If you need an RB1, he is that guy pretty much locked and loaded. He's going to be in an offense with Herbert for the next like two, three years. Going to score touchdowns. He's going to be efficient. So it's a good situation. He's not someone I'm really looking to buy or anything, but I have him here just because I feel much better about him to finish top five than those other veteran running backs like Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, um, and Joe Mixon. So moving on to C tier. 
we have kind of this gap that I have between those like high end guys and then sort of the veteran RB1 type players. And at RB9, we have Travis Etienne. And this is where I kind of take a detour from those vets, like I said. And he is really interesting to me because he's 23. So he's a year younger than Najee Harris. And he has that pass catching skill set that we covet. He was a very good pass catcher in college. He caught a ton of balls. He has rapport with Trevor Lawrence. He's explosive. He has the kind of skill set that we want. He has a very DeAndre Swift type skill set, a very Kamara type skill set. Now, the issue with him is that he had a Liz Frank injury last year. So we don't have any NFL evidence to go off of, which is really concerning. But I think it's important to note kind of the level of prospect that he really was. Remember, he was a first round running back. There was no Jonathan Taylor wasn't a first round running back in the NFL draft. You had DeAndre Swift not going the first round in the NFL draft. You had Javante Williams not going the first round in the NFL draft. Same thing with Brees Hall. In a world where front offices aren't taking running backs in the first round, it is a big vote of it, it's a huge endorsement for a running back to get first round draft capital. You got first round draft capital. In my model, the RS grading system, it is a, a grading system from zero through ten. He graded out as a 9.73 out of 10 which is insanely strong that puts him in the elite tier the high high end of elite tier which hit top 12 seasons at an 80 percent clip anybody with a elite prospect tier designation hit top 12 seasons 80 percent of the time i'm not saying that he's a lock to hit a top 12 season but coming out of school that's kind of profile that he had he is like a 9.73 rating i cannot trust enough like i think that i think elite is anything above an eight i want to say Brees hall was in the range of like 8.2 Najee, er, Etienne again, first round draft capital, really good receiving profile, was a 9.73. The only running backs in my database to not hit a 10, which is legendary, from a 9.5 to a 9.99, Derrick Henry, Melvin Gordon, Trent Richardson, Joe Mixon, Adrian Peterson. I believe all of those guys have top 12 hits, and these are the comps that came out in his database. We have Melvin Gordon, Todd Gurley, Sony Michelle, Marshawn Lynch. Those are three, or those are, those are three very good running backs and Sony Michelle. And sure, he could be Sony Michelle with the injury history and all that, but he has upside for a lot more. I love his skill set. We want to chase players like this with a pass catching skill set. We're very good out of college. Again, I just think with the current state of the position, it makes sense to put him here. Also, the Jaguars have James Robinson, who's going to be slow to come back. They only added Snoop Connor to this running back room. ETN will have every opportunity to kind of prove that he is who we thought he was. Then at RB10, we have J.K. Dobbins. I hope that you guys can't hear that, that lawnmower. Very, very rude of my neighbors to be doing that right now. How do they not know that I'm recording in the basement? But we're going to talk about J.K. Dobbins here. And he is my RB10. And Dobbins is tough because he's young. He's 23 years old. And I believe he's good at football. The issue is, is that he also, like ETN, had a pretty tough injury. So we don't have a ton to go off of for what he looks like going into year three. But these are his pretty much his sophomore comps. So what what the trajectory he was on through two years. And these are some really strong names here. Now, again, J.K. Dobbins is an elite prospect. He is in, after year one, he is in the same range of guys like DeMarco Murray, Melvin Gordon, Joe Mixon, Noshawn Moreno, Ryan Matthews, and Nick Chubb. Now, I mean, Noshawn Moreno and Ryan Matthews aren't great names there. But those are, the other names are really, really strong. My only issue with J.K. Dobbins is I believe that he's a good player. I believe he's talented. I believe that he will have a top 12 season at some point. The only issue I have with him is I think in this offense with Lamar Jackson, the perpetuity, I don't know how he catches enough passes to be a, you know, a 20 point per game guy in fantasy. He probably needs to be a Jonathan Taylor type guy where he gets around like 40 catches and just like 20 touchdowns and 1800 rushing yards. I'm not sure he'll ever put up a season like that. So the issue for me with Dobbins and kind of some of my uh reservations about him is that i believe he's very talented but i believe that he could just be a nick chubb where he's going to hold value because he's talented and because he's young but i'm not sure he's ever going to deliver on the promise of giving you kind of a difference making season at running back then moving on to number 11 we're going to talk about kenneth walker who we talked about a ton already i don't want to spend a ton of time on these 2022 rookies but he's not a super strong prospect in my model you guys know i i don't like that he doesn't catch passes but at this point, he's a second round draft pick that a lot of people love. He's a top three rookie draft pick. And sort of the thesis behind Kenneth Walker and why I have him so high isn't even because I like him, but I think because he's a 21 year old rookie, all he has to do is show something like Javante did last year, just show something, be a fringe top 24 guy, even like Dobbins did his rookie year where you kind of are like a fringe top 30 guy, come on at the end of the season. Uh, Rashad Penny, I hate to say it, as much as I love him, he probably will get hurt for a couple games. He will have a couple times to show if he is good at football. All he has to do is show that he is somewhat good at football. He will pretty much be valued similarly to Javante 
in a year from now where he'll be sort of in that a tier of like a top six running back 22 years old showed flashes in year one that's in his range of outcomes now again if he could catch passes he'd be in a tier for me but because he can't i have him in c tier but i do understand uh, i do understand the upside case for him to kind of gain value in dynasty now we're going to go with d tier and i will say in my actual rankings right now i, I have joe mixon right behind eckler and ahead of travis Etienne. but after sort of going through this and talking these out I now want to put Mixon at 12, and I think I'm going to make that update probably sometime today, but if not, then by the weekend. But I'm generally lower on Mixon and just this entire this entire group in general. Where wait, hold on. I meant to put this on the screen. But the big thing here with like Mixon, Kamara, Dalvin Cook, everybody in this range. First we have like Dalvin Cook and Kamara who have like weird like legal issues or whatever. But the issue I see here is guys who are like 25, 26, 27, all getting old, or like honestly more like 26, 27. The issue is is that when you look at like ADP in redraft, you have Dalvin Cook and Mixon up top who are like first round picks. So I guess they're a little bit ahead of the rest, but when you look at the the top. There's just not a massive difference to me in terms of like median projection between Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, and then guys like Aaron Jones, Leonard Fournette, and James Conner. I just don't see a big difference there. So instead of investing in running backs who are similarly aged and similarly um, expected to produce, like I don't see why you would spend up for Cook, Kamara, Mixon when you can get Aaron Jones, Leonard Fournette, or James Conner for a fraction of that price. For, so for that reason, in terms of just like a supply and demand thing where I just don't think that a Mixon is a is a coveted asset. For that reason, I want to have them lower than consensus. Now, I have Mixon as the top guy in this range because he posted a top five season last year. He hasn't even turned 26 yet. He's going to be turning 26 this season, and he's attached to Joe Burrow on a high-flying offense. So that's enough for me, but again, I just don't think that he is going to give you irreplaceable production you can't get from an Aaron Jones, a Fournette, and a James Conner. I don't own James. I don't own Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook, or Kamara on any of my teams for that reason, So, or Eckler either for that. So with that being said, that is going to do it for us today. That is the entire top 12 of my dynasty rankings. Feel, feel free to ask the, the engagement farmers on Twitter. On Twitter. Oh, geez. Not, not Clitter. Good Lord. Great heavens. Um, but as the fellas on, on Instagram say, sound off in the comments. Let me know where you disagree. I know that you guys are going to hate the Najee ranking. Again, he's in A tier. If you want to have him RB2, you can do it. I understand the case. He's just not for me. Now, with that being said... If you want access to the entire rankings, I'm trying to put myself back on the screen. If you want access to the entire rankings, that'll be on the Patreon, patreon.com slash Ron Stewart. As always, I love you guys. I was going to say we have, we have bangers this week, but we've got bangers every week. So just stay tuned. We'll be, we'll be doing a live stream on Saturday. As always, I love you guys, and I will see you in the next one. I got the juice. I got the juice. Geno, chat, I'm zone. Foolies, glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag of on. Rapper, song, singer, suspended subpoena from misdemeanor.